We'll sing this as a hymn of encouragement. We've been studying for the past two Sunday nights about Archippus. The reason we've been studying about Archippus is we've learned so many things by mistake. We want to share them with everybody who had not learned them so we could understand what was going on, who he was, and what it had to do with us. Now, the first thing we went into, just for a little bit of way of review, is that Archippus is mentioned in Colossians, the fourth chapter, if you'll flip there quickly, and the 17th verse. And so we first of all preached, uh, Archippus, where are you? He was uh, someone who Paul wrote in the book of Colossians, the fourth chapter in the 16th verse, and said, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also to, uh, in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received of the Lord, that thou fulfill it. So the question came out is, what are we worried about, about Archippus? Well, here's the, what we were worried about. <clears throat> Turn to Colossians, the second chapter, and we want to read the first two or three verses, and here's where we ran into trouble. For I would ye know what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea. Do you notice that Colossae and Laodicea seem to be irrevocably joined together? And we're going to find out why. He says, about those with Laodicea, for as many... For and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. It seems that the caution brethren had not seen Paul's face. And therefore they were those who had not the opportunity for things that we know they didn't have. First of all, if you'll flip back to Romans 1 and verse 11... If the apostle or an apostle, and of course in this instance it would be Paul, if an apostle had not been in Colossae, then that apostle could not have laid hands on anybody. And if he didn't lay hands on anybody, they wouldn't have any spiritual instruction from the Spirit of God. Because it came through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. If you want to look at Acts 8 and 17... And Simon Magus saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given. He offered Peter and John money, saying, Give ye me also this gift, that upon whomsoever I lay my hands, he might receive the Holy Ghost. If Paul had not been to Colossae, then the laying on of hands could not have been actuated. And Paul talked, writes to Timothy, Second Timothy 1, he said, Stir up the gift that is in thee through the laying on of my hands. Now, the purpose of the laying on of the hands was to transmit the spiritual gifts that were in existence in the church of Christ for the first century until that which is perfect is come. That which is perfect is come is the completed written will of the testament of Jesus Christ. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter and the 8th verse, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall we know even as also we are known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was transmitted to those whom the Holy Spirit had selected. So in absence of the apostles, the Spirit of God could direct the preaching and the teaching of the congregations where the apostles were not. Now we found out in the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, as we were studying, that the apostle uh, James on the church at Jerusalem had sent Barnabas. After those who had been spread abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8 and verse 1. 
And when they went, somebody had to go find out what they were preaching. And so in verse 22 of Acts 11, the Bible says, Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church which was at Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came, and had seen the grace of God, was glad. Now, how could he see the grace of God? He saw the gospel being preached. That is the grace of God. And he exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added to the Lord. But you notice Barnabas didn't lay his hands on anybody. He just went and checked on what was being preached. Now, as they went from the... Uh, death of Stephen and the church was scattered abroad it wound up in many places those of which some of the uh, churches of Christ were responsible for sent emissaries to find out what preaching was being done there and of course Paul went to find Saul and this was in an area of the country that was up in the northeast corner when I find my uh, uh, of in, in a geography lesson. So here is Tarsus, which is today in um, uh, still in existence in the world in a, in a country called Turkey. And so Tarsus is where Paul came from. Over here is uh, a place called Hierapolis. Then there is also a place called Laodicea. And then there is Colossae. And then there's Philadelphia and a lot uh, of the congregations that we're familiar with. Now, all of this has a story that we'll miss if we don't ask about this gentleman named Archippus. Now I looked this up, whoever was questioning my pronunciation of Archippus, and in the Greek manuals that I have, it is not Archippus, it is Archippus. So, be it good or bad, I did pronounce his name correctly. Archippus was a very interesting young man. But more about Archippus in just a minute. Let me tell you who Archippus' father was. Archippus' father was Philemon. Philemon. That was his father. And his mother was Atha. You say, how do you know all these things? Let's just go back over to the book of Philemon. Don't go to the second chapter. Just stay in the first. But let's go to Philemon. And let's read. And we're going to find out some things that maybe none of us had ever known before. And because of this, we'll be better suit, suited to uh, study this passage. Because what I want to do is show you the um, story of Philemon. Now, maybe you've not remembered, but... In the story of Philemon, we have a young man by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave. He'd been a slave of Philemon. And being a slave of Philemon, he had escaped. And when he escaped, he found his way to Rome... When he found his way to Rome, whatever his problem was must not have been corrected because the next thing you know, he wound up in jail. And he wound up in jail in the same jail as the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul converted him to Christ. And as he converted him to Christ, he found out who he was and where he was from. And when he came around to finding out who he was and where he was from, he sent him home. Where he sent him was to Philemon's house. Now Philemon was the brother in whose house the church of Christ at Colossae assembled. Onesimus coming home was a slave. Being a slave, he was there in a bad situation. 
And the Apostle Paul says, you treat him like you treat me. And if he owes you anything, you charge that to my bill. And if that's a problem with you, you remember that you owe me far more than dollars and cents. You owe me your soul. And so as this occurred, we began to see a story that's interesting. Because here in Colossae, we have things that are stretching out all over the place. Now the first thing that I taught you concerning Archippus, as we started this inquiry, was that Archippus dates the date of the writing of the book of Revelation. There's a lot of our brethren that do not know when Revelation was written. They'll tell you since it's the last book in the Bible, it was the last book that's written. And I've taught you and showed you many times that that's probably exactly the opposite to the truth. Uh, it was probably one of the first, if not the first book, that was written by inspiration of the Spirit as Paul was used after he became a Christian in about A.D. 60, I mean, A.D. 58 or 59. Well, there's more to it than that. Because, you see, if you'll go back now to Colossians, the fourth chapter, you'll see that Paul makes a statement that actually determines the date of the writing of the book of Revelation. Are you there? I'm waiting on you. In Colossians, the fourth chapter, Paul writes and says these words. He says, And when you read the letter from the church at Laodicea, I mean, when you read this letter, cause the, the letter from the church at Laodicea to be read in your hearing. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, how many times have you found yourself reading the letter to the church at Laodicea? Most people think because it's not as long as these other letters that Paul wrote to, it wasn't a letter of great importance or of great concern. But when you read the letter of the church of Laodicea, you will see that there is great importance attached to it. If you have it, it won't take a second. Turn to the book of Revelation, the third chapter and the 14th verse, and we'll read quickly the letter to the church at Laodicea. The Bible says in the angel of the church and, and, and under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Now in my survey and study of the church at Laodicea, guess who the preacher was? Archippus. Archippus was Philemon's and Aphus' son. And the reason we follow the name Archippus is because the brethren in our in our history have told us Chrysostom, Theophlect, and uh, and all the brethren of that period of time, without question and out uh, without concern, tell you that Archippus was Philemon's son. Who, by the way, in about A.D. 83, both Archippus and Philemon were martyred. So they died for the cause of Christ. Don't know what happened to Apha. Nobody has ever recorded that. But being the preacher at Laodicea, now let's go back to Colossians 4, and you'll find out that Paul says, tell Archippus to fulfill his ministry. In our language, in our lingo today, it is do the job you were appointed to do. What is it that Archippus had not done? Archippus had not preached the gospel as he knew it had to be preached. He'd been lazy and indifferent. And the church at Laodicea had bluntly and blatantly lost its place with the Lord. You ready now? Revelation 3. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, 
and I would thou wert cold or hot. I want you to be one or the other. You either be hot or you be cold, but don't you try to be lukewarm. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, in other words, you just don't do the job you were told to do. You want to just come by, sit back and take it easy and be indifferent. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Remember the chastening of a father to his son. Remember the way Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy, stir up the gift that is within thee through the laying on of my hands. Paul, in his writing to Archippus, says, get him to do the job he knows he's supposed to do. He didn't preach the gospel to the church at Laodicea as he was supposed to, historically. In A.D. 80, Laodicea was blown off the map. According to history, there was a great windstorm that came through that area, and Laodicea was totally eradicated from the earth. And the brethren at Laodicea, according to the teachings of the brethren that lived in that area, went and worshipped with the church at Hierapolis. There's no way then, folks, that in AD 81, if Laodicea didn't exist, John, whom most people think is the author of the book called Revelation, which he's not, he's just the penman. Paul was the author. There would be no way that Paul could write this letter called Revelation. You say, well, I don't believe Paul wrote the letter. Well, I know, and a lot of people don't. But let me show you that Paul signed his name. You know, when somebody signs their name, that means they wrote it. All right, you go back now to Colossians 4. It says, verse 18, The salutation of my, of, by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Now, hold your finger here and go to 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, and the 17th verse, and we're going to read... The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is a token. In every epistle, so I write. And here's the salutation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, to make a long story short and get to the point, do or have you read of the signature on the book of Revelation. Well, turn with me to the book of Revelation, the 22nd chapter, and we'll start with verse 18. He said, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away them uh, from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And from the things which are written in this book, he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Verse 21. Are you with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Somebody told me the other day, I don't know if Paul wrote the book of Hebrews or if he didn't by the inspiration of the scriptures. Let's go find out. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. And if we find some kind of a salutation 
that Paul would always use in his letters, we'll know. Do we know that he wrote the book of Romans? Sure, we'll find that salutation. Do we know he wrote the Corinthian letters? Sure, we'll find those salutations. If you go through those books, you'll find these salutations. You're in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, no, the 13th chapter, I'm sorry, and verse 24 and 25. Salute all of them that have showed you the way. Now, your translation, if it's the King James, has followed the Roman Catholic concept and said, had the rule over you. The Greek word is hegemai. Hegemai is not somebody who is ruling you, but it is somebody who has showed you the way and showed you how to live. Salute them that have shown you the way. And all the saints, they of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Any other books you want to check? We can check. But we, let's, I mentioned Romans, so let's go back to the book of Romans. We'll go to Romans, the first chapter. And I'll show you that the Apostle Paul, of course, put his salutation here so that everybody, and of course he puts his name there so nobody has any doubt about it, but it's still the same truth of which we try to stand in defense. Romans, the first chapter, and the seventh verse. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when Paul is writing to the Colossian brethren, he puts an anecdote in. He says, you read the letter from Laodicea. And oh, by the way, when you read the letter to, from Laodicea, you say to Archippus. Now it's an interesting thing that the word Archippus means chief horseman. I don't know if you have, um, go back, and I haven't looked this up in a day or two, but let's go back and look at it. Zechariah, the sixth chapter. The horse, the, you've heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? And you've got people who have uh, painted paintings, and they've got horses riding around all over the place. When a horse was the way that God described the preacher that was there in the area. And so if you'll go back, you'll find that this is the language that is being discussed. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, if you're there. Are you with me? In Zechariah, the sixth chapter, and verses 1 through 7, it says, And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked unto me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. These are the preachers of the gospel that were going to preach the gospel to the four corners of the earth. There was the black horse, there was the bay horse, there was the grizzled horse, and there was the uh, other horse. Now, when you go to the book of Revelation and you talk about the horses, you get to the sixth chapter, and the first place you start by hearing this terminology again is the first horse who was the messenger of God, was sent to preach. Turn to the Revelation, the sixth chapter, and you'll see. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him. Now, of course, he's not talking about a four-legged horse that's going to run around with a mane and a tail. This was spiritual language which described the preacher of the gospel. Archippus means chief horse. What you find is when you study Archippus, you find that Paul added a personal note like he did to Timothy. Timothy, do what you're supposed to do, son. Stir up the gift that's within you through the laying on of my hands. Or like Peter would write later, shake the grates. 
Now, you people have never lived in Tennessee like I have, but when a fire gets low and you go down and you're supposed to get the fire hot again so that the house can be heated, you look inside to see if there's any clinkers in the fire. You know what a clinker is? That's a piece of uh, of coal that's burned so hard that it's become hard and there's no oxygen or air can get in it. And when those clinkers get down in the way, they'll stop the flow of air and you'll get cold. My job as a little boy in the house, as a young man in the house, I thought was a little boy, they thought was a young man, (laughs) was to go and shake up the grates. These clinkers would stop and fall on these grates, stop the air off, and you'd go cold. So you had to go move these clinkers. That wasn't the best job in the world. And it was cold work, but somebody had to do it. The chief spokesman for God in that area was Archippus, the chief spokesman. Who was he? He is mentioned here and in the letter to Philemon, and everybody that I know of that would write concerning this brother, Chrysostom and all included, said he was the son of Philemon, in which case he'd lived in a fine Christian home in Colossae. He was a minister, a leader, and he had the charge of the assembly of the believers where he preached unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, Right. In the book of Philemon, as we read the second verse, he is spoke he is spoken of as Paul's fellow worker. Now a fellow worker is somebody who did the same function or job as Paul did, and that is his preach the gospel. So Archippus was a man of special privilege, the son of Christian parents members of a Christian household and called to a special function by the Lord. And it was this man that Paul felt compelled to send a special message, a word of warning. Son, do what you've been called to do. Now somebody is always going to ask you, how do you know if the Lord has called you to preach the gospel? The way you can determine that is if the burden is so heavy on your heart that you can't be satisfied in living in Christ without preaching the gospel, you better get busy and get prepared. Archippus had been in a situation where he wasn't too excited about the position he was put in. I've been in some towns, and when I got into some towns, I found some preachers who were in congregations that were put there by their daddy, who was an elder, because of the desire and the want of their mo- of their mother, and they just weren't too excited about preaching the gospel. They you know, they get up and preach and they do their little thing, but as far as defending the faith and trying to light a fire under the brethren to get them to go into the area and preach the gospel, they just didn't have any concern. That want to was out of their eyes. And you wanted to hear them when they were preaching. You wanted to hear them stand up and defend the truth. To stand up for Christ. To do what Christ had commanded. To cause the brethren to have a fire in their belly. And to live for the Lord. And they wouldn't do it. And so, in a situation like that, you'll find out that these people are usually removed from that function by the Lord who will not be mocked by them not uh, doing as he is commanded. Archippus, do what you're supposed to do. Being pleasured by living with a man and a woman of such greatness as Philemon and Apha, Archippus had not decided to do what God wanted him to do, but kind of take it easy and let things have its course. You know, I don't want to get too excited with the brethren. I'm not going to get too, uh, getting them too much on fire. I'm not going to try to cause them to preach the gospel too much. And this is that which is also discussed in uh, many other places in the Bible. But the place that I always go to when I think of this, and 
This is just instinctive with me because I don't think there's any equal to this con- this uh, verse on the subject is uh, the prophet Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah said the same thing, but in a way, and I'm looking up the verse right now because I have it over here. In, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah prophesied. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah. We'll find it. Find it the hard way. In the book of Jeremiah, I think it's the 20th chapter, you're going to see the same language about what Paul was doing with Archippus. Are you there? Maybe you beat me to it. I can get these pages to cooperate. Yeah, you with me? Jeremiah 20 and verse 7. I want you to listen. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. And I'm in derision daily, and everyone walketh me. Of what was Jeremiah deceived? The Lord had told Jeremiah to go preach to the Jews, and they'd repent. The trouble is Jeremiah had gone and preached, but the Jews hadn't repented. Lord, I I, I was all ready to go. I was gung-ho. I was going out to go do the job. Verse 8. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence, and I cried spoil. Because the word of the Lord had made me a reproach, was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said... I'll not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But, now here's the big clincher. But, his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stop the message from coming out of my mouth. I could not stay. For I heard the, read, I heard the defaming of many, Fear on every side. Report, say they, and we will report it. All my familiars, that is his fellow prophets, watched for my halting, they watched for my destruction, saying, peradventure, he will be enticed and we will prevail against him and we shall take our revenge on him. We'll get even with this boy. He's caused us some trouble. He's gone and preached where we preached and he's got these people all stirred up and we don't know what to do with them. But the Lord is with me as a mighty terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. And you can continue the rest of the chapter. When the fire and the love of the gospel of Jesus Christ is in your heart, and you cannot stay without preaching it, you cannot be satisfied, without making sure that that message is preached to the world. You then should be trying to find you a place to preach the gospel. But if it's not, and you don't have that fire in your heart, then the admonition of the Lord to preach the word might be that you would be as Archippus had had from his father. You know, there's a lot of other things you can do besides preaching. Maybe you can bring up your children and train them and instruct them so that your child might be a preacher of the gospel as you would have taught. Maybe you could be the one who offers great hope by going out and being real good in personal work and teaching somebody the gospel of Christ that way. Or maybe you can do something in the church Being a privileged person to have the opportunity to serve the Lord in any fashion would be an opportunity that all of us would want. Or maybe yours would be a task of showing love for people maybe behind the scenes. You may be too timid or too incapable of speaking, but you can do your bit or your part because you have this desire to serve the Lord in your heart and you can't get it out. 
Or maybe you are given the dreadful job of exercising correction of some of the brethren that just won't live right. You're a privileged person. But you may get the blunt of such a task. Or maybe your task is that of praying. Somebody says, is that all I can do? All you can do. Do you know how many thousands of years that man existed before he could go before the throne of Almighty God in prayer? And you say, is that all I can do? Man, you just don't really know what privilege it is to pray to God. You see, the members of the body of Christ each have a function to fulfill. Now, the first thing I will advise you is to find your function. If you will read Romans 12 and Ephesians 4, well, we're real close to Ephesians, so flip back to Ephesians 4. We're going to read about these brethren who had functions. And their function was to aid in the preaching of the gospel. Look at verse 16. For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of, the, of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself and love. Oh, yeah, you may not be the preacher. Maybe you are, are called Mr. Encourager. Or maybe you're called the person who's always willing to go and try to do something to show love behind the scenes. Or there's so many things that we can do in the cause of Christ. But everybody's got a job. And if you don't see that job, you better try to find it. Archippus you better complete the work that the Lord gave you. Its meaning is really taught in such a way that we unhesitatingly, unquestioningly, and unconditionally obey the Lord to try to do everything that He's commanded to do as the Apostle Paul, when he wrote of his last days, could report. You remember? I'm now Paul the Aged. And the time of my departure is at hand. Listen, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. And I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them that are love is appearing. Ah, Paul says, I fight, not as uncertainly. I bring my body in subjection. I make the spiritual part of my anatomy control the physical part every time it gets in trouble. And when I bring it into subjection, I preach. Turn back to 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, and I'll read that to you. I've quoted it, but if you want to check it out and you can read it for yourself, you can find just exactly what I'm saying he said in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 9, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I, Paul said, therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I. Not as one that beats the air. You know what I mean by shadow boxing? Shadow boxing never accomplishes knocking anybody out, does it? Paul says, I'm not shadow boxing. I really get out there and get in the fight. Ah, you won't hear me and me say, well, you know, I talk about Jesus Christ to somebody, but, you know, they're not going to receive it. No, that's the shadow boxer. The boxer is, let me tell you. I got into a biblical discussion the other day with somebody in a denominational church. And we got down tooth and toenail in the study of the scriptures. Now, I didn't make myself any personal friends. But I wasn't there fighting for me. I was fighting for Jesus Christ. And they may never, ever appreciate me. But there's one thing about it. They won't stand in judgment having heard my name, be able to say, 
He never mentioned him to me. He never told me I was lost. He never told me I wasn't a part of the kingdom of God. Paul says, I fight. And I keep my body under subjection and bring it to the means whereby it will serve its function, not me serve it. So that when I've preached to others, I myself might not become a castaway. And I cast away with some garbage that was thrown in that nobody would ever use. The duty of Archippus had not been one that he had participated in. Now somebody might say, well, why? Have you ever known of one family that had three or four letters from God? Well, the family of Philemon had the book of Philemon, the book of Colossians, and the Laodicean letter written to one family and maybe you may not know why and maybe I'm guessing but you can think as you desire and that's your privilege there was a man by the name of Onesimus remember the slave the slave came back from Rome when he came back from Rome if he'd been treated like a slave and been treated like a dog what he had been taught by the Apostle Paul would have not done anybody any good. But what Paul put in Onesimus' heart came out in Onesimus' life. Maybe you don't know it, but the church at Ephesus had the greatest preachers of the first century that preached there. It had Timothy as a preacher. It had Paul as a preacher. It had the Apostle John as a preacher. Do you know who followed John? Onesimus. Folks, the intent that Onesimus would be able, because of his love for God, to fulfill his function was made by the Spirit of God to be allowed. Archippus where are you, boy? You don't do the job. I'll replace you. Fortunately for Chippus, according to history, he died a martyr's death. I'm glad of that. We can sign off. Job well done. Onesimus. As far as History reveals Onesimus did more good for the church at Ephesus than all the other brothers before him. He had a job to do. If you're here tonight and you don't know what your job is in Christ, if you don't have a burning zeal to do what he wants you to do, if you can't put yourself in a place and say, man, I can do this. This is my job. I can handle this. I look around. I don't see anybody doing it. I've always been working with crews and with people, framing, building houses. And we always worked in pairs and partners. And I could look around and see if old boy couldn't pick up that wall, I'd go help him. Or if he couldn't pick up the beam, or if the truss was about to fall on him, I'd go catch it. It didn't take a Solomon to figure out that everybody working together got the job done a whole lot better. But yet in the cause of Christ, a lot of people think that their only job is pew warmer. Pew warmers don't get it. We have a job that the Lord can use us to do. And it might be mowing the grass, it might be this, it might, it might be five or six other things that nobody else would want to do. You ever heard that song Walt Disney put out, Whistle While You Work? You never heard that song, Just Whistle While You Work? And the idea was, it didn't matter. It might have been a job that nobody wanted, but this old boy was happy to be in that function and be able to work and be, be able <coughs> to cause the thing to be successful. And usually whistling is done by people that are happy. Unless you hear me whistle, 
If you hear me whistle, I'll make you unhappy. Because I can't whistle at all. But the idea is, put your shoulder to the wheel. Find out where and how you can serve the Lord. Don't step on anybody to get in the way. Don't be jealous of any brother or any uh, thing like that to aid the cause of Christ. Always be ready and willing. You know, I guess if we could follow the teachings of the Scriptures, the best number two man that Jesus Christ ever had in this world started out as his enemy. Are you a good number two man? Or if you're not a number one man, you're going to blow up the boat. Well, find a place. Don't let the Lord be looking for you at death, crying, Archippus, Archippus, son, where are you? What would you do? And then read that letter from Laodicea. You'll find out what he hadn't done. Whatever your need is, we're going to stand and sing. Number 172, the invitation is yours. Will you come? There.